morning, everyone. Uh, tonight's program is sponsored by the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women, which promotes equity for all women and girls. I am the program chair of the Summit New Jersey branch of AAUW, also called Summit College Club, founded in 1920, the same year that women won the right to vote. If you are interested in joining us, please visit aauw.org. We welcome women and men who hold the associate degree or higher. This year, we learned about many brave suffragists who worked against all odds to win the vote for women. Tonight, we welcome you to Stony the Road We Trod, our program on black suffragists. Janice Harris Jackson is a women's rights and civil rights activist from Plainfield, New Jersey. She holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Montclair State University. On the faculty of Kane University for many years, Janice was the first to hold several important positions there. First admissions recruiter for black students, first foreign student advisor, and founding member and past president of Concerned Black Personnel of Kane University. Janice is a member of the American Association of University Women and has worked on Tech Trek, the STEM summer camp for rising eighth grade girls. She has held leadership positions in the New Jersey NAACP, New Jersey Association of Black Educators, and the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs. Janice worked with our AAUW branch on our very successful Reader's Theater, The Road to Women's Suffrage, originally produced by the League of Women Voters. I am proud to present Janice Harris Jackson. Now I'm waiting uh, for the screen to come to me. Leslie, how do we do that? Uh, let's see. Okay, you want you... the speaker view. If you do speaker view, then you'll see you. Okay. Let me just get started. Good evening. My name is Janice Harris Jackson, and this evening I am honored to lead our important discussion on Black suffragists. First, let me thank the League of Women Voters of Berkeley Heights, New Providence and Summit, and the Summit College Club branch of the American Association of University Women with very, very special thanks to Leslie Carson and Marlene Sincaglia. Welcome one and all. Stony the road we trod a discussion of black women and the suffrage movement. As we have said, 2020 marks the centennial of US women's suffrage or the passage of the 19th amendment, the women's right to vote. This was not an easy journey for white suffragists. We cannot imagine how stony the road was for the black suffrages during the eras of slavery and Jim Crow. They were confronted by both America's dehumanization of African-Americans as well as the racism from white suffrages who do, did not want black women to have the right to vote along with them. They were also confronted by many reactionary American women, white and black, who were anti-suffrage. We come together this evening as an ideal way to pay devoted homage to these courageous black suffragists. Let's look at visual page one, Marlene. First, we will spend just a couple of minutes on the two women who are considered by all to be the matriarchs of black suffragists, Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. Sojourner Truth was born into slavery as Isabella Bomfrey in Swartkill, New York, upstate New York, 
answering a calling in 1843, she changed her name to Sojourner and began traveling and preaching as an abolitionist. After emancipation, truth brought important publicity to the suffrage movement with her unique oratory skills, like her famous Aunt I a Woman speech in 1851 in Akron, Ohio. The courageous Harriet Ross Tubman was called Moses as she led more than 300 slaves, including her own parents, to freedom on the Underground Railroad. After the Civil War, at emancipation, Harriet settled in Auburn, New York, where she began actively promoting women's rights and attending suffrage events. Harriet's suffrage activities were supported by the progressive Thompson Memorial AME Zion Church. From its earliest years, the AME Zion Church has been known as the Freedom Church. And so Journa Truth and Harriet Tubman both embrace the spirit of reform and activism that we will see is associated with the AME Zion Church. Regrettably, these two important matriarchs for black suffragists did not live to enjoy the passage of the 19th Amendment. Let's look at visual page two. Mary. Wait, 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 wait. Terrell, I'm going to keep rolling while you put it up. Mary Church Terrell, 1863 to 1964. We're going to get her. We want to begin with Mary Church Terrell. Yeah, well, I need to put some in the page two. I know I want to get to page two. Um, I need to. Oh wait, okay, hold on. Ta -da! Mary Church Terrell, who is my personal favorite black suffragist. There she is, beautiful Mary Church Terrell. She's my personal favorite suffragist because her commitment to civil rights and women's rights represented such a moral choice for a woman who was born into such privilege. Also, she is the black woman whose application forced our own AAUW to integrate its membership in 1949. It's a complicated story explained on the AAUW website. Mary writes for us in around 1890, the first large suffrage meeting which I attended was the one in Washington at which the women who were interested in the subject were present from all over the world. At the close of one of the meetings, the presiding officer requested all those to rise who believed that women should have the franchise. Although the theater was filled at the time, comparatively few rose. I was among the number who did. I forced myself to stand up, although it was hard for me to do so. In the early 1890s, it required a great deal of courage for a woman publicly to acknowledge before an audience that she believed in suffrage for her sex when she knew that the majority did not. That's from a colored woman in a white world, Mary Church Terrell's autobiography. As one biographer points out, Mary Church Terrell was born in Memphis, Tennessee, the year that President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And she lived to see the NAACP's triumph with Brown versus Board. I think she died a couple of weeks after Brown versus Board took place. 
one of the first African-American women to earn a four-year college degree from Oberlin in 1884 and a master's degree from Oberlin in 1888, she returned to Memphis and a father who had become quite wealthy, reputed to be one of the first black millionaires in the South. Her father, Robert Church, was the master's mulatto son who was both favored by his white father and who became a shrewd Memphis businessman. A young Mary insisted on teaching when her wealthy father wanted her to be a lady of leisure. She wrote, relocated from Memphis to Washington, DC, where she would call home for the rest of her life. At Oberlin, Mary became active in the suffrage movement. She would become a spokesperson for the National American Woman Suffrage Association, NAWSA, and a close friend to its founder, Susan B. Anthony. Mary would integrate white suffrage organizations early in her life, giving speeches like The Progress of Colored Women in 1898. In 1904, Mrs. Terrell gained international acclaim for a speech she delivered at the International Congress of Women in Berlin, Germany. Her extraordinary education, fluency in many languages, and extensive traveling allowed her to honor the host nation by delivering her address in German, then French, and to conclude with the English version. On October 18, 1891 in Memphis, Church married Robert Heberton Terrell, a lawyer who became the first black municipal court judge in Washington, DC. She met Mr. Terrell when she was a teacher and he was principal of M Street High School, now known as Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. The Terrells had three children who died in infancy. Their daughter, Phyllis Terrell, was the only one to survive into adulthood. In her autobiography, Mrs. Terrell speaks about the 1892 lynching in Memphis of her childhood friend, Thomas Moss. This event radicalized her as well as Ida B. Wells Barnett for their vitally important civil rights work. Mary Church Terrell's many firsts are too many to cite, but we must say that she helped found the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, and she served as its first president. Now you Deltas listen up to this. In 1913 and 1914, Mary Church Terrell helped organize the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, coming, becoming one of its earliest advisors and honorary members. More than a quarter century later, she helped write the sorority's creed. In 1913, NAWSA held its famous suffrage rally in Washington, DC, and its organizer, New Jersey suffrage, Alice Paul, did not want black suffragists to participate. In defiance, Mrs. Terrell, led all 22 young women who had just founded Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated at Howard University. She led all 22 young founders in this historic parade. The founders of Delta Sigma Theta as their first public act confronted racism in the suffrage movement. Ida B. Wells Barnett, the anti-lynching crusader, who would also become a Delta, marched with the white Illinois delegation. In 1946, Mary Church Terrell was invited to join the AAUW Washington, D.C. branch, and some members opposed Terrell's admittance because she was African-American. Mrs. Terrell was still an unwavering activist for civil and women's rights well into her 80s. AAUW president, Dr. Althea K. Hattel, 
the distinguished Pennsylvania educator, visited branches across the country to lobby for revision of the bylaws at the 1949 National Convention in Seattle. AAUW members voted overwhelmingly 2,168 to 65 to revise the bylaws so that membership could be granted to all women with college degrees from AAUW opposed, approved universities. Let's look at visual page three. In 1909, Mary Church Terrell, was one of the two African-American women who became charter members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, which is still America's oldest and largest civil rights organization. The other woman was Ida B. Wells Barnett. What was their relationship and what impact did it have on the stony road for black suffragists. Ida B. Wells Barnett, 1862 to 1931. The anti-lynching crusader was a bold African-American investigative journalist, educator, and an early leader in both the civil rights and suffrage movements. Ida was born the last year of the enslavement in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Both of her parents were slaves and her father, James Wells, was also his white master's son. Not as favored as Robert Church, Ida's father, James Wells, was trained to be a skillful carpenter who made a very good living. The horrific 1878 yellow fever epidemic, which allowed Robert Church to make his fortune in Memphis killed both of Ida's parents and an infant brother. At age 16, Ida went to work and kept the family together. Later, she bravely relocated only about an hour away to Memphis, Tennessee. A young Ida Wells pursued a teaching career in Memphis, but she was a political firebrand, even by today's standards. In 1884, she was dragged fighting and biting the conductor's hand from the ladies' car to a segregated car on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. She sued the railroad and won. Eventually, the verdict was overturned. I could not help wondering why Ida B. Wells Barnett and Mary Church Terrell, two famous and accomplished early Black suffragists who would often be thrown together by history and fate, seemed not to be friends. When Ida's erratic decisions caused her to teach in California, Missouri, and Tennessee all in one year during 1886, there were plenty of hurt feelings and ruffled feathers along the way. Ida writes to Robert Church for money to get back to Memphis. Remember, that's Mary's father. Ida B. Wells Barnett continued to teach elementary school, but her heart was really in her writing. She began writing weekly articles for the Living Way Weekly newspaper under the pen name of Iola. In 1889, she became editor and co-owner of both the Free Speech and Headlight. In 1891, of course, Wells was dismissed from her teaching post by the Memphis Board of Education because of her articles that criticized conditions in the, district, in the district's black schools. Again, I go back to the 1892 lynching in Memphis, which was the event that radicalized both Ida B. Wells Barnett and Mary Church Terrell and should have brought them together in a friendship. When the black proprietor Thomas Moss opened the people's grocery in a part of Memphis called the Curve, racist white jealousy for this black business's success led to violence. Black people left Memphis in droves because as he was taking his last breath, 
when he was lynched, Thomas Morse told his people, leave Memphis and go west. The lynching and the exodus were the racist reality for economic equality. The tragic event led Wells Barnett to begin investigating lynching as a journalist who would earn international acclaim. Wells Barnett encouraged the black exodus from Memphis. A white mob eventually ransacked the free speech office, destroying the building, its contents, and terrorizing the other owners. Wells Barnett had been out of town in New York. Her life was threatened. She was in exile, and she never returned to Memphis. In 1893, the world's Columbian Exposition brought Ida to Chicago, where her anti-lynching journalism was already very popular. In 1895, Wells married attorney Ferdinand L. Barnett, a widower with two sons. Wells and Barnett met in 1893, working together on a pamphlet protesting the lack of representation at the Columbian Exposition. Together, the couple had four more children, Charles, Herman, Ida, and Alfreda. In her autobiography, Wells described the difficulty she had splitting her time between her family and her work. She continued to work even after the birth of her first child, even traveling with a nursing infant. Throughout her admired career as an activist, journalist, and suffragist, Ida was impulsive, erratic, and outspoken to a fault. In addition to being a gifted journalist, Ida certainly had an exceptional education for a black woman in the 19th century. Having earned a sort of normal school credential from Rust College in Holly Springs, and having done some coursework even at Fish University in Nashville, but comparing her own education to Mary Church Durrell's, she writes in her autobiography, it was at this time, 1896, that the union of the two wings of the women's clubs consolidated and Mrs. Mary Church Durrell was elected president. Mrs. Durrell, a graduate of Oberlin College, who had been a teacher in Washington High School for a number of years, herself being the wife of a prominent attorney in Washington and believed to be the most highly educated woman we had in the race. In Wells Barnett's autobiography, which she left unfinished by the way in 1928, her daughter Alfreda uh, completed the work for her. She mentions Mary Church Terrell a few times. In 1899, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, whose president at that time was still Mary Church Terrell, intended to meet in Chicago. The Chicago organizers of the event stated that they would not cooperate in the meeting if it included Wells Barnett. Wells Barnett seems to have been becoming a very controversial figure for more traditional Black women. Mary Church Terrell complied with the request that she be excluded, and Ida Wells Barnett writes in her autobiography, it was a staggering blow. Mrs. Terrell claimed not to understand why. Even so, she obeyed their bidding. I told her that although I was very much surprised at the action of the women of Chicago, I was still more surprised that she obeyed the dictates of women whom she did not know against one she did know who had come from her own home in Memphis, Tennessee. There is absolutely no mention of Ida B. Wells Barnett and Mary Church Terrell's 1940 autobiography. In terms of historical need, Mrs. Terrell may have been genteel to a fault. I thought of how difficult it might have been for two Black women's rights sheroes like the late Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and the late feminist Florence Flo Kennedy, if any of you were exposed to her, to work together in the 60s and 70s. Stony the road 
was with such personal discord and incompatible personal styles that had some impact on the documentation of the Black suffragists' achievements. In 1909, Ida B. Wells Barnett was the other of the two African-American women who became charter members of the NAACP. Now let's look at visual page four. Crusade for Justice, Wells Barnett's autobiography clearly documents Susan B. Anthony's admission that she had accommodated racism for the sake of expediency in the suffrage movement. It also moves us to our other black suffragists. First, Ida B. Wells recalls, end quote, those were precious days in which I sat at the feet of this pioneer and veteran in the work of women's suffrage she had endeavored to make me see that for the sake of expediency, one had often to stoop to conquer on this color question. She then quotes Mrs. Mrs. Anthony, Frederick Douglass was an honorary member of the National Women's Suffrage Association, but when the Equal Suffrage Association went to Atlanta, Georgia, knowing the feeling of the South with regard to Negro participation in equality with whites, I myself asked Mr. Douglas not to come. I did not want to subject him to humiliation and I did not want anything to get in the way of bringing the Southern white women into our suffrage association now that their interest had been awakened. Finally, from Crusade for Justice, so Wells' autobiography, while Ida B. Wells was in exile from Memphis, she spends some time living in New York City and writing for the New York Age Black newspaper. This was a very important date for her. On October 5th, 1892 at Lyric Hall, a committee of some 250 of Brooklyn and New York's most prominent Black women hosted a testimonial for a young Ida B. Wells. She cites Mrs. Sarah Garnett being on the platform at the event, which Wells Barnett describes, and I quote, the real beginning of the club movement among the colored women in this country. Let's look at visual page five. Let's look at Sarah J. Smith Tompkins Garnett. She lived from 1931 to 1911. Sarah J. Smith Tompkins Garnett was an African-American educator and suffragist from New York City. As we have been reminded by Mrs. Terrell, women had to be brave and unconventional to advocate for suffrage in the late 1880s. Sarah Garnett was the founder of the Brooklyn Equal Suffrage League, which was the mobilization arm of the National Association of Colored Women, NACW. She also served as the superintendent of suffrage for NACW. She was present, if not presiding, at all of the suffrage events of her day. Born near Brooklyn, she was a pioneer as the first African-American female school principal in the then segregated New York City public school system. She took over as principal of grammar school no, uh, number four in 1863. The Tunis G. Bergen School in Brooklyn, PS9, was renamed in 2019 to Sarah Smith Garnett Public School, number nine, after a movement to remove the slaveholding Bergen family name from a school whose students are 40% African-American. I love that picture there. It may have been one of the last taken of uh, Mrs. Garnett. It was the year before she died. Uh, Sarah also had a very interesting personal and family life. She was the eldest of 11 children born to Sylvanus and 
and spring steel smith, free blacks who farmed land in Queens County when it was a part of the Shinnecock Indian Reservation out on Long Island. The community was historically inhabited by people of mixed African and Indian ancestry. Sarah was widowed twice, first marrying Samuel Tompkins, who died in about 1852, and two children from that marriage also died prematurely. After the distinguished abolitionist Henry Highland Barnett was widowed, he and Sarah married. While serving as ambassador to Liberia, Henry Highland Barnett became ill and died in 1882 in Monrovia. Sarah died in Brooklyn in 1911. Let's look at visual page eight. Reverend Doctor Florence Spearing Randolph, 1866 to 1951. Reverend Dr. Florence Spearing Randolph is our great black suffragist from Union County. First and foremost, Florence was a stalwart and lifelong Christian activist. For her exemplary work as a religious leader and women's rights activist, she and the church she pastored from 1925 to 1946 Wallace Chapel AME Zion Church in Summit, New Jersey. They are featured as a site on the New Jersey Women's Heritage Trail. Please take a look at that. Let me stop right here and extend sincerest thanks. I understand he's on the Zoom to Reverend Dr. Dennis Harriel Jr., current pastor of Wallace Chapel AME Zion Church for his kind and gracious generosity and sharing information with me about both Reverend Dr. Randolph and the remarkable history of the AME Zion Church. Thank you, Reverend. Like Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, Reverend Dr. Randolph received great support for her suffrage work from her AME Zion Church community, the Freedom Church. In 1894, the AME Zion Church was the first Black denomination to ordain women as ministers. Oh, it took the Baptist Church decades after that, my church. She served as a member of the Executive Committee of New Jersey Suffrage Association and was the founding president of the New Jersey State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Florence Fearing Randolph lived a personal testimony of equal opportunities for women. She graduated from Avery Normal School in her hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, and she apprenticed in dressmaking. Coming north to visit her older sisters in Jersey City and New York City, she realized how much more money she could make, so she relocated to Jersey City. In 1886, she married Hugh Randolph, a Richmond, Virginia native and Pullman Company railroad cook. The industrious young couple bought a home in Jersey City and devoted a portion of it to Florence's dressmaking business. Their only child, Leah, was born in 1887 and unfortunately Hugh died in 1913. Florence Spearing was the second child born to John and Anna Smith Spearing in Charleston, South Carolina in 1866. Both of her parents were from established free black families. Having grown up in Charleston's Methodist Episcopal Church, she became an active member of the Mama Street AME Zion Church in Jersey City. Reverend Dr. Randolph's journey to the clergy began in 1897 when she sought a license to preach. Despite controversy and opposition from the church's all-male officialdom, Reverend Dr. Randolph moved toward ordination as an evangelist, then a deacon, and then an elder. Let's not forget that the AME Zion Church supported the work of the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass as well as suffrage. Reverend Dr. Randolph was assigned to pastor Newark's Pennington Street AME Zion Church 
that has become Clinton Memorial AME Zion Church. She worked in many different AME Zion churches in New York and New Jersey during the next 12 years. They were usually small, poor, and in debt, these churches, so she never collected a salary. When she was assigned as temporary minister to Wallace Chapel in 1925, there were only about 35 members who met at the Lincoln YWCA and Summit. Reverend Dr. Randolph incre increased the membership substantially, served pay faithfully under another pastor, and as the second pastor, built a red brick chapel that is still in use today. When she retired in 1946, she left the church debt-free as pastor emeritus of Wallace Chapel AME, Reverend Dr. Amy Zion, Reverend Dr. Randolph moved to Montclair, New Jersey to live with her daughter, Leah. Reverend Dr. Randolph continued service to her church until she died at age 85 in 1951. Reverend Dr. Randolph's community strengthening and progressive suffrage activities were well acknowledged. She joined the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1920, shortly after suffrage passed, she worked with Plainfield's Lillian Feckard, and I understand Ms. Feckard has, uh, uh, a, is a part of the history of the League of Women Voters, and she was head of the Republican Women's Division. Reverend Dr. F Randolph traveled throughout her life doing important missionary work. There is the beautiful story about her travels from 1922 to 1924 in Liberia and the Gold Coast, which is now Ghana, from which she returned home with a young Ghanaian girl named Charity Zumala. Charity attended the public schools of Summit, our own AAUW Summit College Club branch, gave one of its early scholarships to charity, and she attended Hampton Institute, very close to my heart, Leslie, my husband and my son are Hampton alumni. Then charity returned home to Ghana, where she enjoyed the teaching profession for uh, the rest of her life. Reverend Dr. Florence Spearing Randolph enrolled at Drew University in 1926, making her the first African-American woman to do so. And the university offers a theological school prize honoring her. Also in 1933, Reverend Dr. Randolph was the first woman to be awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from the AME Zion sponsored historically black Livingstone College in North Carolina. Let's look at visual page seven, please. Reverend Dr. Randolph's granddaughter, Anise Johnson Ward, saved a suitcase of her grandmother's papers, which included many sermons. Those sermons are included in the 1998 text by Dr. Betty Collier Thomas, Daughters of Thunder, Black Women Preachers and Their Sermons, 1850 to 1979. Unfortunately, I was not able to get that book to prepare for this presentation, but it is en route to me now, and I look forward to enjoying it. Let's move to Violet A. Johnson, 1870 to 1939. In 1939, Reverend Dr. Florence Spearing Randolph officiated at the funeral service of 69-year-old Violet A. Johnson at Fountain Baptist Church in Summit, New Jersey, the church founded by Johnson. Fountain Baptist Church is the oldest Black church in Summit, New Jersey. Although all of the Black suffragists were challenged by the intersectionality of race and gender, for Viola Johnson, her unique interaction of prejudices, oppression, domination, and discrimination was further complicated complicated by class and caste. She was a domestic servant. 
Can you imagine a meeting between Violet Johnson and Kimberly Crenshaw, the modern 21st century black lawyer and scholar who coined the term intersectionality as a way of explaining the unique oppression of African-American women? Violet Johnson was born in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1870, among that first generation of Africans born after slavery. And she was able to obtain about an eighth grade public school education. In the early 1890s, Johnson moved to Brooklyn, New York, where she was first employed as a domestic servant by the John Eggers family for whom she would work as a housekeeper some 45 years. She began her community activism in Brooklyn, joining the Concord Baptist Church of Christ. In 1897, she relocated with her white employer to Summit, New Jersey. Summit was transitioning from a rural village to a suburb with about 100 Blacks in a population approaching 5,000 in 1897. Violet Johnson led six domestic workers to meet and form a Christian Endeavor Society prayer and Bible study group for African-Americans in July of 1897. Within a year, the Bible study group was formally recognized as the Fountain Baptist Church, the first African-American congregation in the suburb of Summit, and what a popular church it is among African-Americans in Union County and beyond. This was the beginning of what is remembered as Violet Johnson's genius for organization. The intersectionality of race, class, and gender both guided and challenged Violet Johnson's religious and civic leadership. She served in such roles as vice president of the New Jersey State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and chair of its anti-lynching department, local and state officer in the Colored Women's Republican Club, a founder and vice president of the Summit NAACP. Now it's called the Tri-City Branch of the New Jersey NAACP. I was recently introduced to the history of Violet Johnson during the Newark History Society's program, The Battle Over Women's Suffrage in Newark. The very talented Noelle Lorraine Williams from Rutgers Newark and the Newark Public Library discuss the often omitted role of African-American immigrant women suffragists. Following the resounding defeat of New Jersey suffrage referendum in 1915, our black suffragists increased their public presence, organizing the State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and strengthening ties with the white group, the Equal Suffrage League. While national suffrage politics continued to struggle with racism, in New Jersey, the public image of suffrage moved toward a biracial sisterhood. The New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association, NJWSA, moved its headquarters from Newark to Plainfield, where NJWSA president, again, I mentioned the name of Lillian Becker, she lived in Plainfield. This progressive white suffragist, then known as the leading figure of the New Jersey suffrage movement, continued her efforts to facilitate white and black clubs working together. Ms. Feckard may also be an unsung Shira. With the ratification of the 19th Amendment in August of 1920, Violet Johnson was prominent among New Jersey's Black women who mobilized their religious and civic networks to deliver a win for the Republicans. Again, I remind you, all of these women were Republicans back then. Uh, those Republicans, elected the first African-American to the New Jersey State Assembly. He was Dr. Walter G. Alexander, a physician from Orange, New Jersey. Violet Johnson and 
Reverend Dr. Randolph worked together in Summit to accomplish many amazing community strengthening feats as fellow Christian activists and suffragists. In 1918, Johnson, with the meager income of a domestic worker, established the Industrial Home for Working Girls or the Home Away From Home in Summit. Over the years, this house was a safe haven dwelling for some 800 women and girls. Viola Johnson died at that home away from home in 1939. Reverend Dr. Randolph officiated for her funeral at Fountain Baptist Church, as well as at her interment where she was buried in an unmarked grave in the Eggers family plot. Let's look at visual page eight, please. For those interested in learning more about the lives of Viola Johnson and Reverend Dr. Randolph in Summit, New Jersey, there is an excellent book called Black Women Christian Activism, Seeking Social Justice in a Northern Suburb by Dr. Betty Livingston Adams, who I am told lives in Summit. Again, extending my appreciation to the battle over women's suffrage in Newark, this virtual event, uh, Dr. Tim Christ, president of the Newark History Society, explained that Newark was at the center of the suffrage activity in New Jersey. Noel Lorraine Williams from Rutgers Newark and the Newark Public Library discussed black and immigrant suffragists. And Dr. Charles Robb from William Patterson University gave a presentation on Newark as the center of the anti-suffrage movement in New Jersey. Democratic bosses and the city's breweries feared that women voters and temperance leaders like Reverend Dr. Randolph and Lillian Beckert would bring in prohibition. Let us never forget that Newark at one time, at that time, had eight breweries. We can uh, access, uh, access that event on youtube.com at the Newark History Society uh, site. You might like to uh, see and hear it. It was a very excellent program. Please also take some time to visit an exhibit called Radical Women Fighting for Power and the Vote in New Jersey. It began in uh, January and will run at least through December uh, 31st, maybe longer, at the Newark Public Library. Noelle Lorraine Williams is the researcher and curator. And please call the library. I have uh, the uh, address there um, because they're closing at very strange times during this pandemic. So make sure you talk with them before you just go to see the exhibit, but please try to see it. Let's look at virtual page nine. Let's conclude with two popular black suffragists from my hometown, Newark. I grew up in East Orange, but I was born in Newark. There were also these women in uh, the first generation born after slavery where abolitionist passions transitioned into a brave commitment to suffrage. First, let's say a word about Musette Brooks Gregory, 1876 to 1921. Musette Brooks Gregory was born in 1876 to Eugene and Oceana Edward Brooks in Washington, D.C., where Musette attended public school. She would become a teacher who was also very involved in community service. When she moved to New Jersey, she was elected to the executive committee for the New Jersey Suffrage Ratification Committee. She moved to Newark in 1910. She and her husband had no children. Gregory died on July 26, 1921 in New York City because of her significant achievements with civil rights and suffrage, the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs named a scholarship in her honor. And finally, Blanche Jefferson Harris, 1878 to 1956. Harriet Blanche Jefferson Harris, 
known as Blanche, was born in Maryland in 1878 to Simon and Alethea Jefferson. Like many African Americans of the period, the Jeffersons moved north in the Great Migration for better opportunities. Um, she had one child, Catherine, who was born in 1921. Blanche Harris's suffragist role was a part of her work as a Republican because in the early 20th century, the Republican Party was the party of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in 1912, Harris helped organize African-American support for Theodore Roosevelt's presidential campaign in which he was the only candidate to officially endorse women's suffrage. She served as president of the Colored Women's Suffrage League of Newark and she died in February of 1956, and she is buried in Newark's Evergreen Cemetery, that is the one near Hillside and uh, Union County. Let's look at visual page 10. Stony the road we trod. I have taken this title from the National Black Anthem or the Black National Anthem. Uh, it was written in 1905 by James Weldon Johnson, put to music by his brother, J. Rosamond Johnson, uh, for Abraham Lincoln's birthday in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, usually as we gather, uh, Black people will sing the first verse and the last verse, but this is the second verse. And Stony the Road We Trod certainly does sum up the experience of Black women in the suffrage movement. And I'm going to end this evening with the words just brought to us by Paloma Harris, Vice President-elect of the United States. She remembers her mother and then she says, all of the women who worked to secure and protect the right to vote for over a century, 100 years ago, with the 19th Amendment, 55 years ago with the Voting Rights Act, and now in 2020, with a new generation of women in our country who cast their ballots and continued the fight for their fundamental right to vote and be heard. Tonight, I reflect on their struggle. I stand on their shoulders. And ladies and gentlemen, so, do I. Thank you for listening. Let's go to some questions. Well done. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. When we get through uh, some of the questions, what we're going to do is put up uh, our last uh, page of the references in case you want to write them down. But let's have questions and a discussion. Are you taking them uh, verbally? We were doing it, we were doing it through the chat, but uh... Yes, uh, let's take them verbally, shall we? Okay, that might be easier. I have a question for you. Yes. Okay. I am a, a curator and newspaper article, uh, newspaper uh, newsletter editor for a local historical society. And I've been uh, putting together information for an article on uh, suffragists and uh, Union County in our town. My question is this, in doing my research, I understand that Frederick Douglass was an early suffragist and the suffrage movement and the human uh, suffrage movement were closely tied, but as it got close to the 19th Amendment that the uh, male suffrage movement decided to distance itself from the women's suffrage movement because it saw it as diminishing it. 
that the male suffrage movement, I'm not understanding. Uh, the black, men black, the... Bl black males were fighting for suffrage and they saw the white or uh, the largely white led female suffrage movement as diminishing uh, their movement and sought to uh, move away from it. Well, let me answer you in this way. I'm, I'm not a historian, but this is what I know. Uh, if we go back to the amendment that gives black men the right to vote, that's long before 1920, there were some ruffled feathers uh, even between Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass uh, because she wanted him indeed to be more supportive of suffrage. And he thought that it was moving the focus away from black men or really all cit uh, citizens. Was that the 14th amendment? Someone help me out here. Um, but as we move toward women's suffrage, uh, the 19th Amendment, Dr. Charles Robb in this excellent presentation by the Newark History Society, and you might uh, look on their website and give uh, Dr. Tim Christ a, a call. Uh, he was asked directly if the black community in Newark was in support of women's suffrage and he he said they were very much in support of women's suffrage as we approach 1920. Thank you. Another question. I hope that answered your question. Yes, and thank you very much. And Janice, may I ask you a question? That, that was such an interesting review going into personal depth and also professional accomplishments of these women. Did you know any of them or did you have a person whom you were studying who especially spoke to you and in, in your interests? Well, did I know any of them? Right. Like, for example, some of the last ones who were alive in the 20th century? No, uh, definitely not. I did not mm -hmm. even know that Reverend Dr. Uh, Randolph and Violet Johnson existed until I saw the uh, program Battle for uh, Suffrage in Newark with the Newark History uh, mm -hmm. Society. Uh, most of these women, oh, maybe Mary Church Terrell was the one who lived the longest. Uh, I am very proud to be an alpha baby boomer, but I would not have known any of them who uh, were dead by 54, 59, you know, I was a child. And could I ask you one more question? How do you feel personally about Kamala Harris? Are you really proud or excited or are you scared that she's going to be put into a position that might put her under the limelight a little too much or, or how do you feel about that? I am so proud. I, I don't have words to uh, right, describe yeah. how proud I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I have given you evidence this evening that she won't be put in any position that she can't handle. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm ex extremely proud and uniquely proud that she is the first person uh, heading toward the White House who attended a historically black college, Howard University, University right, right. Mm -hmm. Howard University. And uh, she brings things in her background that uh, are really up to any challenge. She's going to be a learning experience mm -hmm. for all Americans. Mm -hmm. All women are proud, I'm sure, mm -hmm. of her accomplishment. Yes, yes. Another question. Hi, um, I have, I have like some general. I have like probably two general questions. Maybe um, one is like, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really great, and uh, thank you. You're welcome. And I was 
thinking about um, how all these um, notions of intersectionality intertwining between uh, uh, race, race and gender and how, uh, you know, white suffragists weren't necessarily the most supportive for black suffragists, unfortunately, and how that, uh, that has become a bit of a barrier. And I was, and now will you look, and now if you look back at uh, uh, when we see like present day, uh, I would say instances of these kinds of intersectional barriers between race and gender and even uh, socioeconomic class. Um, I'm just wondering, what would you say um, if anyone wants to uh, talk about more or learn more about these uh, issues that are happening like today? That's just my first question. How would women go about talking about these issues? Is that your question? Um, how would women go about talking? Well, not even like talking, like what would, like, um, what would, you know, I would say, could you like, what would you say to like, what would, what would you think about like some of the intersectional barriers between like today, when you look at like, t you know, intersectional barriers between uh, instances, you see in instances of racism and sexism today and uh, back then. Do they still exist? Are you asking? Oh, no, I'm not saying, I am, I, I know they exist. It's more about, you know, I just want to hear like what you would think about like, how would you, what would you say to people who are trying to fight those barriers now? Well, I think what we've done tonight is a first step. First, we have to talk about it. Um, women have to interact to realize uh, what is unique about another woman's struggle. Uh, as a, a working mother, uh, I say to you that uh, when we decided to have our children and go back to work, I learned a lot about how different pressures are on women in different communities. And I would say to you as a black woman that still today, I'm a retired educator, I've worked all of my life and I still often can't figure out if I feel prejudice or bigotry, why? I don't know whether it's because I'm a woman, whether it's uh, because I'm black, whether it's because I'm not as wealthy as some of the people. It, it's always a, a question that uh, you struggle with. And uh, I think we talk about it and we help each other and uh, we find uh, solutions together. I think tonight is a wonderful step in that direction. I hope that answers your question. Other questions? Oh, uh um, and it, this is Beth Dorer. I'm a uh, League of Women Voters uh, member in New Providence, Berkeley Heights and Summit. Um, I wanted to ask actually a question of the role of textiles in the women's suffrage movement. In particular, Gail Mitchell has a um, 19th Amendment um, uh, textile behind her, and maybe she knows more about how textiles were used in the women's movement um, in, as a whole. And we have to say now, and Gail is going to talk about quilting. Gail and I grew up together down the way in East Orange, as we like to say. Is Gail on and able to answer? As far as textiles go, is that what yeah, uh, Marlene was asking? I really don't know the history, but I am a quilt maker and I've always been interested in African-American <laughs> history and especially in black women. So I have a lot, many, many quilts. Uh, 
related to African American history. And this is one that I'm really proud of because it has Alice Paul, Sojourner Truth, and a lot of Harriet Tubman on. So I used to um, talk about this at libraries for adults and, and children. And I educated people by showing my quilts. But thank you for not noticing it. Now, Gail, uh, all Black women quilted, maybe not in our generation, but certainly my mother talks about how her grandmother quilted when she brought her family up from Alabama <coughs> to New York. Uh, now, I don't know if it had a particular <coughs> impact on Black women who uh, were suffragists. Do you know anything about that or? I know I'm not, I do not know about that. I, do, I don't either. Mm -hmm. But I do know that Harriet Tubman was, a, uh, who was Harriet Tubman? Sojourner Truth was a knitter. Oh, she, she knit it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's something that we uh, might look into. Let's, uh, at this point, Marlene, put up the references page, the, the last visual. That page eleven. There we are. Page eleven. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In case there are some books that uh, you want to get more information out of, these books were absolutely excellent, and I'm sure that twenty five years mm -hmm. ago one would not have been able to access these books. Mm -hmm. There was also a book mentioned in the chat. So if people went to the chat, there was a book mentioned uh, in there that was maybe also very recent. Yes, there are several references there that people, people might like to look at the chat. Could this, could this list be made available uh, because yeah, we can put it on our uh, on the league web page. It could be sure part will. Uh, well, Marlene well, part of the yeah. We I mean, Marlene has it. What I am going to uh, we appreciate having it. And uh, if you want to start with a book, I could not live without this this one, Past and Promise about New Jersey women. So many of the women I talked about tonight, they were from New Jersey. They are in here. Mm. Uh, and it's time for them to do another one uh, because they stopped at women born in 1921. And we have lost so many important uh, women, women's rights people who need to be in the next edition of uh, Past and Present lives of New Jersey women. It was done by the Women's Project of New Jersey, as you see. And Marlene, when you send it out, you might want to do the actual PDF other than the email. I think it's clear. Um, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So um, it was amazing. I want to thank you um, for how do we get a copy or how do we, I know it was being recorded. I would love to hear it again because it was just so much and I, I try to take as much notes as I can. Um, who am I speaking with? I, I, uh, I'm doing this for the first time. My name is Alex Miles. I'm Alexander. Oh, okay, Alex, okay. Um, so I would love to hear it again if you can. I mean, I would like to like get it, listen to it again if you can. Marlene, you can explain that. Marlene will explain to you. It, the recording will go on our web, on the league website, which is lwvbhnps.org. Okay. Um, it stands for League of Women Voters, Berkeley Heights, New Providence Summit. You just have to give us a couple of days. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so my and question the is- list will also, would go on there as well. So my question is, was there, and in, in, with all of these women that, prominent women that you spoke of, was there a collaboration with uh, women, the white women suffrage movement, or was there this split between the black and white suffrage movement, or would, would, would it be fair to say it was combined, a collaboration? Well, 
Now we're going back to uh, the years prior to 1920. Yes, there was bigotry. Yes, there was racism. But as I tried to point out, there was one particular white woman in New Jersey, Lillian Feckard, and she has something, Marlene, to do with uh, the history of the League of Women yes. Voters, I believe. She's one of the founders of the New Jersey League of Women Voters. Okay. And she worked very hard to make the suffrage experience in New Jersey uh, one of a collaboration among white and black women. So she was exemplary in that way. Mm. And uh, Susan B. Anthony, uh, she stooped to the need uh, to exclude black women uh, when she had to, even though she was very close friends with black suffragists, very close friends and with Fred, Frederick Douglass. Now remember, uh, the Deltas would like for you to remember this, if nothing else, uh, that famous 1913 march for suffrage in Washington, D.C. It was organized by the New Jersey Quaker white suffrage yes. Alice Paul. That's right. She did not want Black women to march in the parade. That's that right. was when Mary Church Terrell <clears throat> fired her. The Deltas had just been founded. She took all 22 of the young founders to march in that parade. That is a very special moment in the history of this country and in women's history. So it depended. Uh, Alice Paul, we don't applaud. Lillian Feckard, we do. And right. then B. Anthony, you, you have to read a little bit more about her position, but she certainly was a, a dear friend to many of the Black mm. Does that thank, answer? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Mrs. Jackson? Yes. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Harry L. I just want to uh, take Harry, the time to. Thank you. Thank you I just, so much. I want to just take the time to thank uh, the League of Women Voters and American College Club and you for such a in-depth and powerful presentation that uh, is so much needed, particularly in today's climate. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much that is coming to the forefront now of our history uh, and contributions that have been omitted from the classrooms, where, whether they be college or elementary, middle school or high school. And this was so powerful. So I hope that there will be a way that we can uh, use this material in our churches, in uh, uh, wherever, because this is what is needed today. The absence of knowledge is, is dangerous. And the uh, once knowledge is, is known, it is uh, empowering. And you have done such a beautiful job. Just to hear you uh, mention about the connection between uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Florence Randolph and, and Viola Johnson, many people right here in Summit do not know that connection. I didn't and, know. And it is, you know, and particularly our young people, yeah. um, yes. of all races, they just don't know because we were not taught this. We were taught a few simple uh, things, some names, uh, but this goes into, once you hear this, you really can see the connection of how the struggle began and even though the struggle is continuing. So I, I applaud you for doing the in-depth research and, and uh, excellent, excellent presentation, much needed. And also, I think Leslie had asked about uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, 
uh, I'm I'm proud to say that uh, uh, I'm a, a, a graduate of Howard University. So <laughs> she and I are alumni of the same college. So we have that connection. And so, proud you should be. And I thank you so much for sharing with me, uh, as I said to you in my thank you note to you, yes. if we don't tell our story, somebody else will. And they, and they might like not do the job that we want to see. That's uh, correct. Let me say <laughs> just very quickly about the uh, AAUW, how I was initiated into it. Uh, my friend in New York, uh, was doing the leadership the Eleanor Roosevelt way and I raised my hand and I said, I hope you will give appropriate attention, uh, Joan Monk this was, to uh, her friendship with Mary McLeod Bethune. And she said, why don't you join us? And I had to. <clears throat> And uh, that's the way that things should be done. Yeah, that's, right. uh, that's a good way to get people involved. And once you get involved <clears throat> in doing the research, it's, it's a wonderful journey. And I thank you for your guidance. I did not know what a special experience the AME Zion Church was, but You're I welcome. know now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Janice Harris Jackson, am I on? Yes, you are. Betty Mills, I have to tell you how proud I am of you and how I could listen all night to you reading. I wanted to hear more. Of course, I know what you can do with the poetry. Uh, so many things I could say in terms of how much I learned. Several of the people I thought I knew. And uh, Mary Church Terrell is very dear to my heart as a Delta. But the other thing I want to say, we see the importance of the Black church in the development of American history for Black Americans also. Amen. Remember the uh, residual bitterness and uh, disturbance that was left with the white church in terms of wanting us to be Christians. And here we take a movement and run away with it. And I think this is part of the strength of America today. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. My adopted big sister, uh, <laughs> an alumna from Newark State Teachers College, which is now Kane University. Thank you for joining us, Betty and a very accomplished New Jersey poet, Betty H. Niels. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I think we're almost out of time, aren't we? I have another question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alex Miles, again. Um, so what, what would I take away as far as New Jersey? Like, I'm a, I am moved to New Jersey from New York. Um, so what you're kind of what I'm sensing from what you're telling me is New Jersey, Newark, Summit, and Union and Plainfield and East Orange uh, played a major role, or was it just a role in women's suffrage and uh, you know the rights of women and people of color, or is that uh, is a that major role? A major role in any organization of women. Uh, existing in New Jersey, we certainly have a counterpart in New York. Uh, I hope you'll do more reading about uh, Sarah Garnett, the very first African American woman to be the principal of a school in New York City. And she was a suffragist, a uh, very important woman. And there's a lot more to be said about her and uh, read about her. Beautiful. Thank you again. On that note, I would like to, uh, for, for Leslie and for the um, American Association of University Women Summit College Club and the League of Women Voters of Berkeley Heights, New Providence and Summit, we'd like to thank Janice for her outstanding presentation. So informative 
and so local for, <laughs> for, for all of us in Summit. I mean, I, I volunteered or I volunteered at Overlook Hospital prior to the uh, COVID and I would pass Fountain Baptist Church on my way back and forth. And I, I saw the church and whatever, but now it has added significance for me. And I wanna thank you, Janice, for that, so. And I wanna thank you for having this very important discussion of black suffragists. Well, thank you everybody. And again, this will be on our league website. So in a, like next week or a, definitely after uh, Thanksgiving, you can uh, go on to the website, LWVBHNPS and uh, share, share it with people you know, uh, the word needs to spread out. One of the things about history is a lot of history has horrible things that happen to it, but unless we know it and learn it, we're bound to repeat it. So this is one thing that's, you know, super important. Again, Janice, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for sharing this wonderful evening with us and have a happy Thanksgiving. Bye, thank you. Bye, Gail. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank everyone. you very much, Janice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, Jackson. Thank, Jackson. thank you. Very thank informative. You. This was wonderful. Enjoyed thank it. <laughs> Good night. Good, Good night. night. And thank you, you Leslie. Good <laughs> Mark, night. Arlene. Saren. Good night. I think when all was said and done, we had about 55 participants that actually came on. So that was excellent uh, in terms of that. Wonderful. Who was Maureen? I felt like I should know. There was a, just the name Maureen at one place. I, um, but anyhow, I was going to ask about the black vote during this past presidential election in our